Thank you very much for coming back. The easiest week of your program is now behind you. Now we move into the more challenging part of the things you have to change. I trust that most of you have done your photographs of your pantries or of yourselves, or of yourselves in your pantries. <laughs> did, did anybody manage to do that? I'm not going to ask who did or didn't, but the photograph's actually quite important. Uh, for you, the score charts, have you all brought your evaluate forms back? If you don't have them, you can email them to me. It just means I have to print another tree and it will die <laughs> because you didn't bring your form back tonight. I don't really need it yet. Your form will become important at the halfway point through the program where you get to re-evaluate yourself to see if anything's actually changing. Uh, unfortunately, you never get to evaluate me. <laughs> it's a little thing I decided to leave off the form. Um, so this is just to, for you to be able to follow your progress so that you actually know if things are changing positively or negatively. Because remember, I don't care if you lose weight or not. We are the worst weight loss program in the world because we don't care. That took a lot of growing up and maturity from my side because I keep saying lifestyle, but we kept weighing people all the time. And I hate weighing people. Because it's such a lie, and so many, you put so much energy into that scale. And it makes me feel like I'm Weight Watchers or way less, which is just horrible. So I don't care. You can weigh yourselves at home. We will have a scale here most of the time. You don't have to weigh yourself. If you think the scale is going to make you lose energy, rather don't weigh. Ach, lose uh, motivation is the word I'm actually looking for. Tonight we're going to talk um, a little bit about food more. The first few weeks is going to be about food, what you must eat, how you must eat it, what you must avoid, why. I'm a strong believer in why. I feel like people do things that they understand and people do things they don't understand just for a very short time until they feel like it's not nice anymore. Then they just go back to the way they were doing it before. If you understand, you've got a much bigger chance of doing something. Psychology has shown us, there's got nothing to do with anything, but psychology has shown us that if you stand in the back of a queue and you tap the person on front of, in front of you and say, excuse me, can I cut in front of you? The person will say, no. If you tap the person on the shoulder and say, can I cut in front of you? My child's not feeling well. The person will say, yes. The difference is not what happened or what's going on. The difference is the person's understanding of the need to make the change. So this is what this is about. I'm trying to help you to understand the need to make the change. The changes are there. I've given you lists to follow, but that doesn't help you to do it. You have to understand it, believe it, move towards it all the time. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about, we're staying a bit in the evaluation phase, and um, the part that we're going to address tonight is this little guy right here at the bottom, which I talk about the sugar control phase of the evaluation. Because a lot of us eat sugar much, much, much more than we realize. And I'm going to try and show you a little bit about sugar tonight. So I think we all kind of have an idea about sugar. Most of us have gotten the message now, sugar bad, sugar and everything. I, I believe that's true. If you haven't heard that, please um, read a newspaper or watch TV. Sugar generally is in one of our favorite forms, chocolate by far. When I speak to the ladies treating you, menopausy ladies, pms -y ladies, this is your poison. This is your drug. Leave the cocaine, forget the dacha, just a choki. People, women, ladies will get into their cars and drive to places to buy a chocolate. Women will look at small children and go, if you were made of chocolate. <laughs> it gets a little bit scary, the need for this. But the thing that you're needing in it is the sugar. So I thought I'd show you an interesting thing. If you take an average teaspoon, and you fill it with sugar, it's about equivalent to five grams of sugar. Now the reason this is an interesting photograph is because five to six grams of sugar, if I take all the sugar that's in your blood, you've got about six to nine liters of blood, depending on how big you are. If I take all the sugar that's in your blood now and put it on this table, how much sugar do you think would be on the table? The clue is there one teaspoon of sugar. That's all the sugar that's in your blood at any one time. If you have more sugar than that in your blood, do you know what you've got? 
diabetes. Your body is unbelievably magnificent at keeping sugar in the right place and keeping it out of the wrong place. But we give it a lot of work to do to keep that happening. Here's an interesting thing about how sugar works. The average can of Coke, 10 times the amount of sugar in a can of Coke as what there is in your entire body. So your body, when you finish that can of Coke, has to decide what to do with this because it goes into your stomach, goes into your intestine, and it's got to be absorbed into your bloodstream. In seconds, your body has to respond to that threat because sugar is one of the deadliest substances known to man. We have a disease for it called diabetes. We know it kills hundreds of millions of us every year. It causes an enormous burden on our health. Every, every country, all our health sectors pay an enormous price to keep diabetics alive, surgeries, diseases, operations, what we call comorbidities, high blood pressures, heart attacks, strokes, dementias, our old people with their brains rotting. Alzheimer's is even being called uh, type three diabetes because we've seen the association between insulin and sugar and Alzheimer's disease. So your brain literally rots from sugar. So enjoy that Coke the next time you sip it down and try to imagine one teaspoon equals five grams of sugar. So what does that mean about some of the other things that we think are harmless? Five grams of sugar in 100 mils of milk. A teaspoon of sugar. That means when you put milk in your coffee, you might not have sugar in your coffee, but by the time you've put 50 mils of milk in your coffee, which is pretty average, you have a half a teaspoon of sugar. When you have a cappuccino, you have put one to two cups, uh, to one to two teaspoons of sugar in your coffee. Whether you, what do you do after that? Add a bit of sugar for the sweetness because we don't believe it. The problem is it doesn't look like sugar and it doesn't taste like sugar. And we call it lactose. So it's a milk sugar, but milk sugar is made of galactose and glucose. It's sugar. So exactly half of what's in lactose is sugar. Your, your, your previous picture, this is called sucrose. Sucrose is made up of fructose. You might have heard of fructose, fruit sugar, and glucose. So glucose is the one we kind of want to talk about, but glucose comes uh, often with other things joined or attached to it. You very seldom get pure glucose. So we want to be very careful about it. Probably the biggest problem with this is not the glucose, but in fact the fructose which we won't, I don't think we'll have time to talk about that tonight. But fructose has, has created problems which we are only beginning to understand. Um, actually, I'll talk about that just now with insulin. Here's an interesting thing. The, the American Heart Association recommends that we have 9.5 teaspoons of sugar daily. Can anybody in this room tell me what the benefit to your body is of having sugar every day? It's easy, uh, you would wish. You will get energy, but can you get it from somewhere else if you don't take the sugar? Does sugar provide anything at all that your body requires? Nothing, zero vitamins, zero fat, zero protein, zero minerals, zero nutrients, just sugar. Your body has to use it. It's gotta get it out of your blood quickly. Every time you put it in, it provides nothing. But in spite of that, the American Heart Association decided you should have 9.5, because you wouldn't want to go with 10, that's almost, that's killer. <laughs> so I once, I once saw my child accidentally with 10, I ran across the room, dived at him out of the door, into the swimming pool, rinsed him off, made him throw up, because he, he went 10, he went 10. It was just, <laughs> imagine how embarrassing it would be to stand here tonight and tell you, I'm sorry, my child died of his 10th teaspoon of sugar. <laughs> The average adult today, what's more crazy is somehow somebody worked this out. I think they guessed. But anyway, they decided we have 22 <laughs> teaspoons, but our children are up to 32 <coughs> teaspoons of sugar every day. Where are they getting it? In milk, funny enough, and sweetened milk, no whole worse, and cold drink, and fruit juice. So the majority of the sugars that we're taking in are locked in sugar, sugar, sugary drinks or sweetened drinks. This is an interesting little picture, I think. We eat on average 60 kilograms of sugar per year. In 1822, the average American consumed 45 grams of sugar 
in one, uh, every five days. Today, we're up to 785, and I've seen that figure thrown all over the place. But it easily is up to a kilogram of sugar per week, per person, 60 kilograms per year. I think that's pretty conservative. But these are American stats. We don't have stats like this. This little chart at the bottom is actually a graph. It's not a pile of sugar showing you how much it's changed from 1822 till 2012. The amount of sugar has increased enormously. The paleo diet, which we'll teach you, maintains that 10,000 years ago, when we lived in caves, we used to eat the equivalent of five teaspoons of sugar per year, because there was no such thing as sugar. Maybe a few lucky guys grew up next to the sugar cane patch. They maybe had a bit more. But even if they had it, they had to chew it out of a reed. They couldn't refine it or clear it out. So I reckon they burnt up more fuel chewing it out of, out of that, that grass than they actually got from it. It probably just wasn't worth it. Just beat the children with a stick. I don't know. It's not. <laughs> so sugar has become something that wars have been fought over. The reason there are American, uh, there are African Americans in America is because of sugar. That's why they came to Africa to take black people to farm sugar canes and sugar farms in Cuba. Those, funny enough, of all the Africans that were taken over, it's an interesting thing that they have the best quality of life in the world at the moment, in spite of the fact that it started with a very dark story, which we won't talk about. This is another form of sugar that we often forget about. We don't think of it as sugar. It's not always sweet. We don't notice that we're reaching for these things, and we often will pick up a little thing like a rusk and think it's a harmless, pleasant, tasty little thing just to get the day started. And I've had people who tell me, Doc, I eat no carbohydrates ever. I just have a little rusk when I get up in the morning. And that's kind of the problem. See, that just that, just that little rusk, and this is what I'm going to show you about how sugar works. So these are carbohydrates. We call these complex carbohydrates, although these are not so complex. So you get simple sugars, you get uh, short-chain sugars, long-chain sugars. Depending on how long the chain is, we start to talk about starches or compound sugars. So the longer the chain of sugar, the less sweet it tastes, and the longer it, tastes, it takes to break down in our bodies. So potato is almost entirely sugar, but it takes a while to break down. We'll talk a little bit about that just now. So where does your body get sugar from? This is its favorite place. This is because you've trained it to do this for years and your meticulous training, hard work. Imagine, you remember sugar boot camp where they taught you, hungry, go to fridge, hungry, go to cupboard, hungry, pull open drawer, eat smarty now. So we've all been on those camps, okay? So uh, how about go to the doctor, see how, tell him, let him tell you how sick you, let him give you a sucker. Mm, even this doctor, because the kids love me, because I give them suckers. It's hard to move away from that. Hey, how many grannies are accused of sneaking sugar to the kids when they're staying over, even though mom said, we don't give them sugar or ice cream? It's the little thing you sneak your kid because you think you're doing my arme sien jou ouwer sys te fitskatlak. Jy nie is vir die arme kind stakkie seker. I don't know who talks like that. I made like this in tiny. So here's another place your body gets sugar from. It's glycogen. It's stored in your muscles. There's not a lot of it. In fact, there's probably enough to burn sugar. If your body is working really hard, you burn up your glycogen stores anything between 5 and 20 minutes. That's it. Oh, your sugar in your blood. Do you know how long your body can actually function on the sugar in your blood? Not much more than 150 meters of a sprint. We're a bit like cheetahs like that. We can't, that, it's only a teaspoonful of sugar. It burns it up just like that. Then immediately it has to get sugar from somewhere else because it, has to, it does like to burn glucose because we've taught it to. But in your muscles, they're not your muscles, in your muscles, your body stores this thing called glycogen which is pretty rapidly available for your body to use. The other thing your body can do very cleverly through a process called the Krebs cycle is it can convert proteins, muscles, into sugar that your body can burn. It takes a while. The last place that your body will go is the very voluptuous self that you see in the mirror most days. Uh, it does go to fat. So fat is essentially a very complex form of sugar stored as a thing called a fatty acid, uh, a triglyceride, 
or fat, which is essentially sugar and a little bit of fat combined to it. It's a long-term stored form of sugar. It's very difficult for your body to access it. And for most of us, since we have become so carbohydrate dependent because of our muesli or wheat picks in the morning and our sandwich for lunch and our pasta, pizza, burger, bread for supper, our bodies are so carbohydrate dependent that it actually almost has forgotten how to get to the fat. That's why it doesn't matter how fat you are, you never burn your fat. Your body still gets hungry every couple of hours. Like you would think that an intelligent body would immediately go and look for stored energy and say, don't worry about lunch today, it's on me. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. No. Just, I don't suggest sauces and don't bite. But it's an, it's an, it's an inside job. Okay. So be very careful, and please don't offer, you know, don't invite people to lunch when your body's offering. <laughs> so, we want your body to burn the fat, but it doesn't know how, because we haven't taught it to do that. If you exercise, hardcore, gym, running, sweating, you know, dripping, 45 minutes, maybe if you're lucky, 35, somewhere there only does your body start burning fat. So it first burns sugar, then it burns glycogen, then it burns muscle until it starts to get the fat mobilized fast enough to be able to provide it with energy to burn fat. How many of you gym hard for 45 minutes? It's very quiet. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So it's hard to do that. The, the, the problem with being overweight and unfit because they do often go together, is that to get to a place where you're actually generating enough energy to burn the fat, it takes a lot of work and you generally aren't fit enough to even get to that place where you start burning the fat. So you just destroy muscle. So it's much worse for you. Your body will look for sugar in the place that you have trained it to look. So this is just a really important thing. It's a bit like this. Your body will do whatever it is trained to do. You are in charge of your body. You are in charge of how it uses its energy. You teach it. Every time you put something in your mouth, you are training your body. So, let's talk about insulin. Insulin is a hormone. It's secreted by your pancreas. It's a little organ that sits just here underneath your stomach. This takes sugar out of your blood into the place where it has to go. The liver, the fat, the brain, the muscle. So, Insulin works a little bit like a key. Interestingly enough, every single cell in your body has a little place where a little key can fit called insulin. When the key fits in the lock and turns, a little door opens. It's not exactly like that, okay? But, but we've all been exposed to animated movies enough to kind of get it now. So a little door opens and it calls the glucose to come inside. And the sugar flows from the blood where it's in high concentration if you've just eaten, into the cells where the body can store it or burn it and change it into energy. Because that's what your body wants to do with the sugar. Changes it into energy. It's something called ATP. So as long as the key is in the lock, the door stays open. The funny thing is the key is not in the door. The key is next to the door, which is a little bit relevant for more complicated reasons. Key's here, door's here. The door stays open while the key is in. If too much sugar flows out of the blood, the body starts to go into a bit of a panic mode. The insulin comes out. You have another hormone called glucagon. Glucagon is the hormone that walks around and takes the keys out of the doors, shuts the door. Okay? Made by the same organ, interestingly enough, your pancreas. We always hear about insulin. Very few people know about glucagon. Maybe you remember from school. So glucagon works opposite from insulin. The problem is, oh, I think I've got a picture. There's the insulin receptor, there's the key, sits in the lock, there's the door, the sugar flows into the door. See, now does it feel a bit sciencey, doesn't it? Huh? Lekker? It's different from whatever you did today, hey? It's just like, so, wow. Uh, do you want to know what all these things stand for? I don't really know, it's boring. So anyway, so this is what happens in your body. This is a nucleus, this is the, where the, the genes are kept, your chromosomes that are being formed all the time. These are the things that are deciding how long you're gonna live the health of that little thing there. And they can be damaged by sugar. Another story. So if your body is constantly exposed to sugar, your body can't keep pushing sugar and sugar and sugar out of the blood into the cells. 
So what starts to happen is sometimes the locks get stuck in the keys. The keys even get stuck in the locks. And you start to get a bit of a dysfunction. The body starts to lose its sensitivity to the key. To protect itself, it starts to block off some of the keyholes. Because it can't keep accepting sugar into the cells all the time. It literally has no space because it's a one-way street. It's doors open, sugar goes in. So what happens is the body shuts down the keyhole. So to compensate for the keyhole being closed, the body starts to increase the amount of keys that it makes, the insulin, because it must get the sugar out of the blood. So it becomes a fight between the sugar in the blood and the sugar in the cells. Now remember the cells are the sugar, your brain cells, your muscles, your liver, and your fat. So that's where the sugar is trying to get to all the time. Your muscles can only take so much. If you don't use your muscles, it can't take more. Your liver can only take so much. It has a maximum amount that it can store. Your brain can only use so much, it's got a very, very narrow region in which it can work. So the only place that your body has that can take an indefinite amount of sugar is your fat cells. So that's what keeps filling up. The problem is, is that while the insulin is there, the sugar keeps flowing in. But now remember, your body is starting to get worried about all the sugar, so it's shutting down the keyholes. So now you start to increase the amount of insulin you produce because your body is trying to compensate. It's trying to get somehow to get the sugar out of the blood. Now you start to develop a little disease we call insulin resistance. So do you know if you've got insulin resistance? How do you know? Do you need a fancy blood test to do insulin resistance? Let me help you. If you look down, and there's something between where your eyes are and where your feet are. No. Maybe that's wrong. If there's something here. Then. <laughs> if you can't see the other things, that's a problem too. So boys, if all you can see is the boopy, you have insulin resistance. Case closed because your body has had to deal with extra sugar by packing it into the fat. And guess what its favorite place to do it? Starts around the tummy. Not around the tummy under the skin, funny enough, but around your organs first. And that's a real problem because that's the fat that builds up that starts to kill you because it starts to damage the functioning of those organs. So you don't want it to keep happening. Okay. Let me show you what your body does. This picture, if you've done Bet Your Life before, you've seen this picture. Because it might be my favorite pictures, it helps you understand sugar. Sugar works like this. The purplish pink line is sugar. The bluish line is insulin. <coughs> so when you eat a meal, before you eat, your sugar level is very stable. Your sugar is balanced between your liver, your fat, the sugar's coming out of the cells, glucagon, the sugar's going back into the cells, insulin. There's a beautiful little flow going on there. So that's why you don't actually have to have food in your stomach for your body to control energy. When you eat, though, the sugar suddenly, so you have, say you have a Coke, suddenly huge amounts of sugar are dumped into your system and get absorbed into your bloodstream. Your body has to get rid of that sugar, so soon, soon, soon after, it starts to secrete insulin because it wants to start opening doors to get the sugar out of the blood into the cells. An interesting thing happens, though. There's a little bit of a time delay. When the body has finally got in control of that spike of insulin, which can vary depending on what you eat. If you eat potatoes, the spike might only go like that. If you eat bread, the spike might go like that. If you drink orange juice, the spike might go like that. If you drink Coke, the spike might... It's the same as orange juice. Eh? You're expecting... I know what you thought. Interestingly enough, one of the fastest uh, foods... One of the foods that raises your blood sugar the fastest is whole wheat bread. Go and look it up, people. I don't have to explain everything I say. So there's just no time. And that means I can say anything I want, too. It's not true. I never lie to you. So interestingly enough, white bread is slower than white, uh, brown bread because your white bread's got more protein in it than your brown bread. So if you want to feed a hungry child, give them white bread. Not whole wheat bread. I know, go and look it up. It's weird, huh? Who ever said that? Kind of a fool. So, sugar, up, insulin up. Look what happens here. The, the green block shows you that there's a little gap between the peak of the sugar and the peak of the insulin. So what's happening is that even though the sugar has now started to come down, because your body's controlling it, it's got enough doors open, 
the insulin level continues to rise because your body's still worried about the, the sugar that's in your system. Then your sugar continues to come down to a point here, which is back to its normal stable place, but your insulin hasn't switched off yet. Now remember what the insulin's doing. It's locked into the doors. As long as the insulin is locked in the doors, the sugar now continues to flow out of the blood into the cells, probably the fat cells by this time. But there isn't enough sugar. Now you have a risk of becoming low sugar hypoglycemic. But your body can't allow that because you die, okay, which is quite serious. Not a lot of people, we don't treat a lot of people for that anymore. Um, so, although we do have a special at the moment for treating death, if you, but you have to pay in advance. <laughs> so, basically, you have insulin active in your blood even after the sugar starting to run out. And guess what your body does? At exactly this, uh, sorry, this point here, your sugar is normal, your insulin is still high. Do you know what your body says? It says, I'm sorry, I'd just like to uh, put out a little warning that the sugar is now starting to drop down and we will be needing more sugar very shortly. You of course don't hear that, you hear this, you need coffee. You need to have biscuits with your coffee. You need to have half of your sandwiches with your biscuits and your coffee. You need to go out for lunch. You're beautiful, you're working so hard, have chips. Okay, any one of those things, that's what you hear. You might not even hear it say that, you might just go, yes, that was a nice party we went to the other night, eh? Beer, like that stuff. It's just a, a thought that comes into your mind. That's a craving. That's the first sign of a craving. I have heroin addicts. You know, I know when they're going to relapse because they just tell me they're thinking about when they used to use it. It's the very first sign. Some of you might have noticed that happening to you in this week. Remember when you started feeling sorry for yourself because you can't have that thing? Biscuit, chocolate, small child. Yeah. <laughs> you start to go mad. You have these little cravings. You never wanted that stuff before until I told you you can't have it. Now that's all you can think about. You can't focus on anything, then you cheat. No? It's fine. I'll tell you later about cheating. Um, so this is the problem. So here's what happens to you. Basically, if you eat every time your sugar gets to that imbalance point, the whole process just starts all over again. Your sugar goes up, your insulin goes up, and you basically are like a dog chasing its tail all day long. So every couple of hours, you need to nibble on something, you need to snack on something. Your body never gets to a place where it can manage its energy, manage its sugar. Here's the more important thing that must be said. As long as your body has insulin in the bloodstream, in the keys, in the keyhole, it cannot burn fat. Because sugar flows in one direction when insulin is active, into the cells. If you want to burn fat, we've got to get that sugar to turn around and come back out of the cells. That means no insulin. It means every time you eat, <coughs> insulin goes up. Every time you eat, irrespective of the size of the thing you're eating, insulin goes up. Fat loss stops. If you're insulin resistant, if I eat a slice of bread, let's assume I'm not insulin resistant. I eat a slice of bread, it takes my body about an hour and a half to manage the sugar from that bread. Then my sugar is stable again. If you're insulin resistant or diabetic, your body could spend four to six hours trying to get rid of that sugar that you put into your body. That means for six hours, you are not losing any weight. Now, how many of you go more than six hours without eating? There's no ways. So what happens is the overlaps just start to catch up with each other. You never have a fat burning stage. You are always eating for your next meal. You are always hungry because you have never allowed your body to switch into this phase where it can burn the stored energy. So this is super important. This is my, these two slides are kind of my slides of the series. If you get this, I think when I lost weight, six or seven years ago, I saw a slide like this. And that's when it just the penny dropped, because like, that makes so much sense. So, it, here's the thing, while your insulin is high, this is what I just told you, it doesn't burn it. So how do you reduce the amount of insulin your body makes? Well, you can have carbohydrates or sugars that break down slower, that release the sugar slower into your body. So, lower glycemic index foods, you might have heard of that. Lower glycemic load foods. 
these things you, you might have to look up. But basically, the longer it takes to get into your bloodstream, the lower the glycemic index. Okay, so we talk about starchy foods. If you eat foods that are high protein meals, the insulin doesn't have to react to break that down. Remember, your body can change proteins into sugar. It can use it. It's a slightly longer process. That's why if you're hungry and you come home and you have a slice of bread, you feel better very quickly. But if you have a piece of chicken, still a little bit nibbly for a few minutes afterwards. Then by the time you've had your third piece of chicken, where do you go? Oof, that was actually too much. Now I'm not hungry for supper anymore. Because the problem is your body took that time to change the chicken into the energy and you didn't feel like you'd eaten anything until that started to happen. So that's why proteins take a, a longer time to make you feel better. But once they do, they make you feel better for long. If your body has to burn fats, coconuts, avos, varieties, it uses no insulin at all. In fact, it starts to change energy into a different thing called a ketone. And ketones we'll talk about at some point when we talk about how the body uses fat as energy. Right. What else do I want to show you? Mm. So if, this, if your motto is, okay, wait, I'm doing this diet, and, but I'm just going to cheat just a little. Okay, then the question to you is, do you think just a little doesn't hurt? So we normally ask this guy. So this guy, just a little guy, killed five million people in Africa last year. This tiny, tiny little guy. This guy packs quite a wallop. Doesn't kill as many people. But if we didn't have bees, life would cease to exist. How about this guy? Can you see him? Yeah, you can. I'll just enlarge it a bit. Oh, yes. Ask this guy if a little thing makes a big difference. How poop scared, it's not an official medical word, <laughs> were we all while we watch a little part of our, uh, of our continent catching a bit of Ebola? Look how the world goes into a panic over something that we can't see because they know that that thing let loose will kill us, wipe us out. <coughs> Funny enough, nobody reacts to sugar like that. But I think if we kind of got it, we would have a much bigger reaction to sugar. So this is an important little picture because some of you have been to a coffee shop and you may have been exposed to this poison, uh, cappuccino. <laughs> so the problem with this cappuccino is what? One, it's made of milk and coffee. How much milk is in there? 100, 200 mils? Depends if you have a large one, a grande. Three, four, five, six teaspoons of sugar, you're approaching death, remember. <laughs> then, just in case you weren't close enough, they throw in a biscuit. And if you're lucky, they give you sugar to put in. If you're really lucky, they give you candorel because those people are more into like <coughs> quick death. <laughs> the problem is, that if you put that little thing into your mouth with a sip of your cappuccino, within seconds, your insulin starts to come up, your sugar starts to come up, and before you know it, that little thing has started a cascade that you will be fighting for the rest of the day. That little thing will kill you. Oh, that's not a good one. Wait. Are you ready? Okay, how about these things? This is the weight loss dream of the time. The person who invented this should have won like a Nobel rice prize. <laughs> because what a good idea. Puffy rice. It's not like that hard, oh, it's, it's like a guess in your, t it's puffed. It's like a healthy, because like almost mostly air. The problem is it's little balls of sugar wrapping those little bubbles of air and when you eat it you might feel good for a minute or three while you eat it but guess what it starts to do up goes the insulin up goes the sugar for the rest of the day you will be chasing your rice cake tail <laughs> that was a better one eh? okay wait wait okay well let's see what else this weight loss dream it's like chocolate but not really because it's low calories because remember when you used to be told that you would do Weight Watchers, they tell you jelly tots are free. 
Why? Because it's like a half a calorie a daily tot. And since when could a calorie hurt anybody? Calories are like orphans. They are harmless. <laughs> so the problem is that it has no fat in it. It's got a little bit of protein, but it's got a lot of sugar. So what does it do? Have one bite of this and die. This time the bomb was further in the background. <laughs> They missed. <laughs> Let's see if they have another shot. No. So this little guy, as there's as much sugar in a glass full of orange juice as there is in your Coke, with one added problem. It's all acid. So it kills you in two ways. I know. I just got carried away now. I don't know. It was getting so exciting. Anyway, so just a little bit about the glycemic index. Uh, it was, this was invented by like a human person who decided, surely there's a way to see if there's good sugars and bad sugars. So why did we measure how long the sugar takes to get into your body? And he used an amount of sugar, uh, 100 grams of, of, of glucose, and he compared everything else to 100 grams of glucose. So you have a piece of bread, how long does it take to get, uh, after two hours, what's the level? Carrot, anything that's got carbohydrate in it. And from that, we made up this glycemic index to try to help diabetics to make better carbohydrate choices. Because if you've been listening to me, you've heard me say how healthy it is for carbohydrates, uh, for diabetics to eat carbohydrates. It's just the best thing. Because basically, your body so needs that sugar. It just provides so much of nothing. But anyway, so we, we invented a way to make that even, a really stupid decision sound clever. So what we assume is that if food takes longer to digest, to be absorbed into your system, then it's going to not cause such a rise of insulin, so it's going to be safer for you. So we talk about low GI. So I have a little picture like this. If you're going to make a fire, this is the easy way to understand glycemic index. Which was good, high GI or low GI? If you're going to build a fire and you want to get really warm, you want to warm your whole house, are you going to use this to build your fire? It's going to make a beautiful hot flame. It's going to burn in a second. It's going to be fantastic. All agreed? Yeah. But how long is it going to last? Seconds. It's not good. Nobody will make a fire with paper. So we normally go and look for this guy. So this is what we call low GI wood. You can buy it on the road in, in Durban Road. Just ask for low GI wood. It's next to the Roy Cons. So basically, we... I have decided if we want to have a fire that burns longer, that means I need to eat less often because my sugar is burning up slower. I put in thicker logs. Do you know what the joke is? If I look at energy in my body, now I, didn't, I, I tried to put a picture in here for today. If I had to draw a picture of how much energy my body contains in proteins, in carbohydrates, and in fat, your carbohydrates will provide about 5% of your energy that's all it's in. Remember, there's a teaspoon of sugar that's available in my blood. There's a little bit stored all over the place. My largest store of energy by far is my fat. The truth is, if I had to make a fire, if I really wanted to make a fire, it's too early to, to light a mountain or something. So, but you, you burn something that's going to burn long and hard and hot. You burn a coal mine. We have a coal mine. It's called fat. But we keep making fires with wood and paper because that keeps us going. But the problem is that as long as you're making fire with wood and paper, the body never burns the coal. So your body, 90% of your body's energy, 95, is stored as fat. We want it to go there. This is a little picture of the low GI and the high GI. Glycemic index changes too. So this is a problem with this index, where we told you that certain things are better than others. But there's a problem. If you make something hot, it gets absorbed quicker. So the same potato. A one potato, if it's raw, you'll take how long to eat a raw potato? Uh, don't answer. I don't even want to know. Okay, tend not to like that so much. So we cook it. While it's hot, it gets absorbed quickly. As it cools, it gets absorbed slower and slower because to digest something, your body has to heat it to body temperature. So a potato can go from very low GI to high GI to medium GI. It can change. The same potato. If you chew it faster, if you chew it better, it can increase its glycemic index. It gets absorbed quicker. If it's raw, it's low GI. If it's cooked, it's high. If it's younger, it's low GI. Everybody knows if you pick a peach off a tree and it's hard and green, we say it's not sweet yet. What's the difference is the amount of sugar and the amount of fiber, the balance between the two. 
So where a fruit is ripe, it's got high sugar levels, it's designed like that so we can eat it, or the animals can eat it. But its glycemic index changes as it ripens. So if you eat green fruit, it's low GI. It's very high in fiber, that's why your mommy always told you don't have the green peaches, it's going to make your tummy run. The more you eat, the longer the food stays in your stomach, the slower it takes to get into your intestines, the lower the glycemic index. So a lot of, a lot of uh, packaged foods trick you into telling you it's a low GI food by adding something to the food that slows down the absorption of the food. So you get a very um, uh, common, commonly used cereal called Future Life. There's four million reasons why you should eat Future Life. None of them is because it actually tastes nice. I don't know if you've noticed that. But you get a high GI version of that, a, a low GI version of that. You know how they did that? They added soya and they added a bit of fat, but they added protein, dairy protein. So the one is dairy free, the other one is not. So they tell you it's wheat free, because that's a buzzword, no? Everyone's cool to eat wheat free, but it's got dairy in it, it's got soy in it. It's just killing you in a different way. Mm. All right, I've kind of put this in there because the sugar thing is like a real emergency. But the problem is we're all going to leave here and some of us are going to go to a friend's house and have supper or a drink or something to eat now, tomorrow. It's going to happen. So what do you do now? You don't want to have the sugar. So what's the safest way to buffer that sugar effect? If we want to keep our insulin down, remember you're trying to lose weight now. We're trying to get healthy now. We want to keep our insulin down. So there is a little recipe you can apply. I tell people this. If you have a full stomach and you drop a little bit of sugar into your stomach, it's going to take a while to dilute into that full stomach. It's going to take a while before these colors fill this glass. But if you do it the other way around, if you take the sugar first and then pour the water in afterwards, what will happen is that thing will be green. Do you know how long this will, do you know how much water you have to add to this to make it not green anymore? Never, ever, ad, ad infinitum, eternity. You can never make this water again because you took the sugar first. So when you have the choice, when you have something in front of you, look for something that's not sugary and eat it first for the little benefit that you're gonna have of trying to slow down that hit of sugar. So don't come home at night and have a glass of wine or a beer because it immediately shoots up your alcohol <laughs> that too, but your sugar <laughs> levels. Don't have a sugary snack. Come home and have nuts, biltong, anything, but don't go for the drinks first. It will make a big difference. I can almost guarantee that when you come home for a glass of beer or wine, by, by supper time or just after supper time, you're looking for something sweet to eat again. Have you had that thing? You know you had eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, you start looking around the house for something, just a little bit of something, a little ice cream, a little bit of chocolate, a little something left over, another piece of something that was already packed away in the fridge. I mean, you know people like this. Nobody here, obviously, but you know people like this. So that's because you did it in the wrong order and you got your insulin going. And once you got that insulin going, you literally started chasing your tails like your dogs. So here's the thing, always the sugar last. First the fats and the proteins, then the veg, then the salad, and only because you don't want to be rude, eat the carbohydrates, depending on what diet I'm going to put you on. But that's the order of eating. And that's the reason why. So we're going to give you some carbohydrates to eat, not yet. We're going to remain very nervous about the grains. Grains, we're going to talk about grains next week again. But these, these things cause a problem. They are all high glycemic index foods. They all cause rapid increases of sugar. So we're going to start teaching you to eat foods that don't cause a rapid rise in sugar. You, is it not interesting, or not, that you are at a weight loss course where we're trying to lose fat, and I'm not talking about fat. So this is how the world has changed. And it's very scary, because it doesn't make sense, but the guy that we are out to catch now is sugar. Do you know partly why? Is remember that map in the beginning where I showed you how much more sugar we're eating over the last 150 years? When you look at how much protein we eat, it hasn't changed. When you look at how much fat we eat, it's actually come down because we have low fat yogurt, low fat milk, we cut fat off meat, we don't have butter, we have margarine. We, it's changing, but that's what happens. So 
the whole idea that fat is making us fat doesn't plot out on a graph because the only thing that's actually changed was sugar. Okay, we've got to be very careful of potatoes, new potatoes, baby potatoes, yams. Things that grow under the ground tend to be high carbohydrate vegetables. Now that's going to become important with some of the diets that we teach you. It doesn't mean that they are bad for you, but they are carbohydrates. They are sugars in a slightly dense form. They're locked in with a lot of fiber. That's why you have to cook it to get it soft. But once you do, that's why carrots are sweeter when they just steam for a minute or two. What about these things? I show these things. Oh, because uh, where's this? Lentils, pulses, pulses, beans, and lentils. These are staple foods in parts of Asia. They replace meat very well. They're high protein. They've got good fats in them, but they're also carb. It's quite a complete food, but they've got quite high carbohydrate levels in them. So we will talk about them, but they are generally a nice balanced food to eat. Unfortunately, in our South African culture, we don't really eat a lot of that. No. And when we do, take the beans. How many of you take beans out of a packet, put them in water, and soak them overnight so that you can make baked beans tomorrow? Uh, nobody, because that's mal, because Ku sorted that out long ago. <laughs> so basically, we take our beans from Ku because they've added tomato sauce and sugar. Then they've also preserved them for three million years. <laughs> Just so that they're still nice and yummy when you eat them, hey? Okay. We're going to teach you a little bit about fermented foods. These things start to become... Fermented foods are very interesting. So don't worry too much about this yet. We're still going to show you about this. But when you ferment a food, the thing that ferments, the thing that causes the process to happen is the sugar that's being changed by yeast or bacteria. So that if a thing is properly fermented, it actually is sugar-free by the time it's been fermented or through that process. So a very nice alternative for us. And we're going to teach you um, some cheeses. That's why cottage cheese tends to be a better kind of cheese. It's still dairy. Okay, The cow didn't forget that it made that cheese. But <laughs> the sugar in the cheese is starting to get less. Sauerkraut, cabbage. But by the time it's fermented, there's hardly any sugar in it. Not that there was much to begin with, though, to be fair. Kefir is a kind of a milk ferment that burns up the lactose in the sugar. So some people who are lactose intolerant who can't take the sugar in the milk, can drink kefir. Or maybe can have yogurt, because what's yogurt is also, it's a culture, and the sugar is being used to make it ferment, to make it not rot, but change its taste, preserve it, actually. We're going to talk a little bit about fats and proteins. At the moment, you can't do cheese, milk, creams, because these got high protein, high carbs. But butter, butter is made from the fat of the milk. There's a little bit of protein in it. Do you know that cream, if you look at the contents of your cream that you buy, as you do, anybody? So let's take a, a bottle of full cream milk. A bottle of full cream milk has got 3.5 grams of fat, 5 grams of sugar per 100 mils. A teaspoon of sugar per 100 mils, remember? Uh, 100 mils of cream has got 1.2 grams of sugar and 37 grams of fat. Completely changed. Now, we're all scared of cream because we've been told cream's going to make you fat. It's going to kill you. But the truth is, if I have to choose between the two, which one might be the better one? Might be the cream. Because if I'm trying to avoid sugar, milk's not the way to go. Cream's the way to go. The interesting thing about soup, because you can obviously see the connection between what I've been saying and soup. If you make a butternut soup with water and butternut, it tastes a little bit like watery butternut and you can drink a pot full of it but add in cream now what happens to your butternut soup it's smooth it's creamy it's rich one plateful what do you feel Ooh, there was filling completely different reaction by your body because you know what i haven't got time okay i'll tell you this last thing so i don't know when else i'm going to fit it in an interesting thing is that we've discovered that if you look at the human being and how we were supposed to exist, imagine we have been here for 10,000 10, years and we've been living off the land. Sugar didn't exist in the caveman days. We invented sugar. We found it, we liked it, we just grew it. Um, our body hasn't got a natural shutoff for sugar. Do you know if I put six glasses of water in front of you 
and I say, drink these six glasses of water. How many do you think you'll drink comfortably? Two, three, but that's it, because you know when you've had enough water. But what if I put six glasses of Coke or six bottles of beer? Do you know then that you've had enough? So the human body has got no sensor to tell it when it's had enough sugar or to tell it when it's had enough alcohol, interestingly enough. We have added those things to the foods that we eat, but we have no cutoff for those things. Do you know those nights when you're carrying liquor and the wine's flowing? You would never drink that much water. If I put a bottle of water out there and said, you know, enjoy the evening, there'd be half a bottle of water left at the end of the night. But try that with a bottle of wine. Or don't, because you're all doing a program called Better Life. But watch your friends. So that was a very interesting thing that I learned recently, is that we don't have a cutoff for that. But you know what we do have a cutoff for? Fat. How do you know? Because when you eat a piece of cake that's got a lot of butter and cream in it, what do you go? I can't have another piece of that. It was rich. What are you actually saying? It was creamy. It was fatty. You have a cutoff. I can't. I know I mustn't have another piece of that. But you must watch those wines that you can just keep eating. Nice little chocolate cake. Just keep having more and more and more and more. All right. Mm. How do we eat all our fats and proteins? We want to put piles of salads, and the ones we want to put on is the green, leafy things. That's where all our nutrients are. That's the stuff we need. That's the fiber, and the stuff we don't even like on, is where we get our nutrients from, and that's what we can eat as much as we like of, unfortunately, for most of us and our children. When I say piles of vegetables, we're going to get a bit complicated. When we first started Better Life six years ago, we used to tell people, vegetables, eat as much as you like. A vegetable is a vegetable. But that's not really the case. And it took me a while to be convinced of this fact. But we need to be careful about our vegetables as well and which ones we eat a lot of. And my children help me with that a lot. Because when I say have meat and vegetables, what do they have? Meat and potatoes. Because potatoes is vegetables. We've got to be careful about shooks, uh, fruits. Our fruits are primarily a sugar called fructose. Do you know what happens to fructose? Guess how much, how many peaches can you eat in a row? Three, you lie, a lot, <laughs> boxes. How many, how many grapes can you eat? A lot. You don't have a shut off for, for these things, mostly because they're water and fructose. Do you know that fructose does not increase insulin? Unbelievable, it's the miracle sugar. Guess what it does? It goes straight to your liver. Guess what it becomes? Fat. Half of every gram of fructose you eat becomes fat right there because your body can't burn the fructose as quickly as it burns the glucose. So it gets stored. So your fruit that you thought was healthy, this is going to be hard, is making you fat. Is that weird? You can't think that, hey? It's so like juicy and dripping down here. Watermelon. Meantime, it's just making you fat. Innocent fruit. So we're going to be very strict with fruit. Be very careful about fruit because most of you, when you cheat, what do you tell me you have? A fruit. When you feel like something sweet in the middle of the night, what do you have? A fruit. Because we think it's the healthy alternative. Maybe a green fruit is, but the sweet fruits, you might as well. Well, here, here, you can enjoy this. You might as well have chocolate. <laughs> I said it. Or ice cream. Ice cream's got a lower glycemic index than fruit. Chocolate's got a lower glycemic index than a sparkle or a jelly tot. So you can... Be careful what you're tricking your brain into thinking. Do you know how you give your children yogurt because yogurt's so healthy? What is yogurt? It's milk. It's just milk. It's protein. It's a little bit of fat and it's sugar. It's all low fat and it's sweetened. It's a good way to kill your children. For this week, you're going to carry on following that list that you've been given as strictly as possible. I don't mind if you cheat, but I prefer you to use the word tran transition. <coughs> that means slowly convert your thinking from the horrible, death-defying, diabetic, chasing, no end to that sentence. Very bad. I shouldn't have started it. But just think sugar. Everything you put in your mouth. Think, what is this made of? And what is it going to do? If it's sugar, know that day you're going to eat sugar. Be careful of the things you have assumed were good for you or were healthy. Rather leave them out. You have enough vitamins in your body to get you through this process even while you don't have fruit. 
or vegetables that are made of like potatoes. If you need vitamins, buy vitamins in boxes for now from me <laughs> for 280 rand for two months worth of vitamins. If you've noticed the bowels are moving a bit slower than they used to, it's because you used to have diseased bowels that were very dependent on the fiber in your carbohydrates because it used to rip through your bowels. And that's why they made your tummies run. So while they heal, you can give yourself a, an in, a, a soluble fiber with peppermint probiotics. These are the things you use to keep your body going just for the transition. So if you have problems with your bowel movements, I know a lot of you do, please don't put up your hands. <laughs> Stay in your seats after and we will help you leave the room. <coughs> but get yourself a safe, little fiber just to keep the bowels moving. What's so those the are the two. What's the name? E this is called Easy Colon. Easy colon. It, is what, it does what it says. Easy Colon. And we have it for a very good price. 135 Rand. I think Discam sells it for more than that. So I, I have a few here. The vitamins and the things. Each week I'll bring some things that I think are helpful for that week. So bring what you have. I think that's about as much as you can handle for the night. You've got one week ahead of you. Out of the three weeks of our elimination phase, I need you to do seven absolutely squeaky clean perfect days. Okay? Before we move into the next phase. Excuse? In a row. Yes. <laughs> There's always that guy. In a row. Seven days. In a row. Push through. That means you have to push through one weekend. That you say no. That means you might have to say no to going out somewhere, no to the family bri, no, no. Stand in front of a mirror and practice it. It's not something we say often. No, no, no thank you. I believe in you guys. We're going to tell you more about this stuff next week, 6 o'clock, here. Thank you very much. You are free to go.